So I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker here, and it's, it's Mark Levine. I can't think, as we were thinking of who should we bring to talk in front of this group, we really wanted someone who epitomizes what all your hopes are with, you, with children with cystic fibrosis, about what does, what does success look like? Because I can't think of any individual more so than Mr. Levine that would be this. Now, he will tell you this, but I've known him for a long time successfully, right out of school, full-time job, married with his wife, Jolene, here, two children who are up and out, both of them now, right, up and out, very active, successful in his profession, and very successful in the CF community. And I don't want to steal his thunder with all the things that he's done, but I, I, I not just listening to what he says, but this is what CF is going to be in the future, and that this is what we should all hope for. So, Mark? Oh, thank you very much, Doc. I really appreciate that. Uh, gosh, this is, I'm excited. I am really excited and honored uh, to be here tonight. Uh, this is phenomenal. First of all, one caveat, uh, no graphs. So, uh, I didn't know everybody's putting graphs in. I'm an engineer, no graphs. Who would have thought? I, I would have lost that bet. Uh, anyway, this is, uh, is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, I was walking around uh, talking to the vendors, and it was, there was like a connection. Uh, obviously, I, you know, you can only have one CF patient at these events, so I actually physically haven't been here before. Uh, and this is fun. I like this. Uh, I got a couple of some free stuff and everything, so uh, can't beat that. Uh, anyway, I'm going to talk tonight and uh, talk about uh, anticipation. And, uh, I, you know, well, I've been anticipating this for, for a while. And uh, just to tell you, this group has their act together. Uh, and I'll tell you that they asked me to speak in August <laughs> of last year. That's like, that's seven months. I, I never planned anything. I'm like, I guess I'm free April 3rd. I mean, who, who isn't free? Are you, guys, are you guys free next December 7th? You know, come on. Of course you are. No, we have nothing going on. Uh, anyway, this is, so I've been anticipating this for a while. So one, uh, one piece of information here, uh, take care of a little, uh, little book work. Um, this past Monday was April Fool's Day, right? April 1st. It was also my 49th birthday. I thought, what better picture than a picture of me in orange pants? Because who actually owns orange pants? I, I do, apparently. And uh, uh, so there we are. So 49 years old. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of people like myself with cystic fibrosis, uh, you know, we th like to think that we're beating the odds, whether we're 7, 17, or 70, right, that we are uh, at least in the process of uh, beating the odds. And so we celebrate birthdays, and uh, I'm, I'm really excited, and uh, 49 is cool. It's actually interesting because that graph, Doc, that you showed of the median uh, survival age, I felt, if you actually look, I was born in 70, right, so if you look at that graph, I kind of been chasing it, like, my whole life, like, I was actually, it was always like a little bit above, and then in my 30s, I surpassed it, right? So now, I guess now it's catching back up, which I'm, that's cool, I'm all right with that. <laughs> uh, it could go 80, and I'm like, perfect. Uh, that, that would be fantastic. Uh, but anyway, uh, so there you go. So, uh, 40, so next year, I turn the big 5-0, and I will celebrate my 50th birthday. I'm not gonna celebrate my 21st anniversary of my 29th birthday, like I know a lot of you guys probably will, right? <clears throat> uh, anyway, listen, I, I think it's important to always have something to look forward to. That's what I, I talked about, anticipation. And uh, I use phrases like, I look forward to something. But a phrase, and this is just me, I don't like the phrase, I can't wait. I, I don't like that, and, and again, it's just me. Uh, to me, when you say, I can't wait, you're kind of, I don't I want to say like wishing your life away. Like if you say, hey, I'm going on vacation in August, I can't wait. It, to me, it sounds like you're saying, I wish all the time between now and then just disappeared and August got here. And I got a problem with that, right? Because, well, there's a lot that's going on between now and then, right? So uh, I think it's really important that you, you, know, you watch your words uh, and you know, they kind of depict an attitude as well. So uh, I, I think it's important to think, hey, I'm looking forward to something. Uh, without actually wishing uh, your entire life away. So talking about anticipation, though, 
two years ago, actually a year and a half ago, I was on a, the clinical trial for the VX659. And uh, it's this triple combination that, that Dr. Simon just talked about. And I'll tell you this, the first two days, I knew I was on it. It was, it was amazing. Actually, I was talking to the uh, Vertex guys and they were like, did you, what, did you feel any different? I said, oh yeah. And it was in two days and it was amazing. You know, my like, uh, chest started kind of breaking up, cough, cough some stuff out, and then I, I kind of stopped coughing, which was kind of weird. But it was pretty refreshing. Uh, and I know that my lung function went up uh, like over 10%. I can't tell you how I know that, but um, I also can't say definitively that I was on it, right? I mean, we all know these are double blind studies, right? So I'm just telling you, I know my body, I, I was on this drug. And uh, you know, the, uh, this is, everybody showed this, this is not a graph, it's like a stack thingy, but uh, you know, these, when Kaleidoco came out in 12 and, or Combi, or, or Combi, in 15 and Simdico, I was actually on the trial for Simdico, I have, I'm one of the reject guys. I'm like the second bullet. I got the one, uh, the Delta F508, and then the, I have a stop mutation. Uh, I, it didn't work for me. So I'm glad I was on the trial because they needed people to be able to figure out that it didn't work. I mean, that what would have been a shame is if it came out and I was all excited about it, and then I went on it, and then it did jack. It didn't do anything, right? That would not have been good, and then it would have been a waste of money. So. Uh, but I'll tell you this, the triple combo, that's, that's where it is. But the day that comes out, right, that's, we're looking forward to that. It's, it's going to be a good day, but it's really just a day. And in fact, it's, it's really more than a day. And, and you were talking about the, the quality of life, because really it's, it's about when that comes out, it changes the way people think and hope and dream. And, you know, I wish I could articulate that uh, well, but I'm going to have a friend help. Um, I, I met uh, this woman named Jennifer uh, at one of these virtual conferences uh, back like two years ago. I'll tell you a little bit more about those in the, uh, a little later. Uh, I've never actually met Jennifer, uh, but she, uh, she actually has the same genotype as me, which is interesting. And she posted this on Facebook, and I just thought I'd just read it. She says, uh, in 2000, oops, Okay, that's her on the right, it's Jennifer. <laughs> so, in 2003, I met the love of my life, my knight in shining armor. Since then, I've been living in my very own fairy tale, full of love and adventure. Brent and I have been in love for over 15 years, and he continues to be my favorite part of the day. As a little girl, I was unsure if I would ever get to walk down the aisle and marry my Prince Charming. Due to the aggressiveness of my cystic fibrosis, it was hard to know when the hourglass of time would let loose its final grain of sand for me. Unlike other girls my age, I didn't have dreams of the white dress, the bouquet of flowers, or the wedding venue of my dreams. When Brent, Brent asked me to marry him back in 2010, I was overjoyed and I said yes. However, we came to the hard realization that navigating the health insurance situation would be much more complex than we expected for a CF patient that was married. Last year, I enrolled in a clinical trial that would shift my fate. My lung function has increased from FEV1 38% to 52% and rising. For a CF patient, that's a pretty big increase. As a result, I've been feeling like I'm 18 years old again. I wake up every day feeling so thankful. It's an unbelievable feeling to be able to breathe deeper and with more air flowing through my lungs. The crackle in my lungs has dissipated. I breathe easier, and we both look to the future with hope and excitement rather than fear. Throughout my life, I've been the flower girl, the bridesmaid, the makeup artist, the bouquet catcher, and the fiance. On March 1st, 2020, I'll get to be the bride when I marry my forever and always, my infinity and beyond, the love of my life, Brent. And, uh, It pretty much brought me to tears the first time I read it, and almost just now. Uh, I mean, thank you, Jen. I, I couldn't have said it better myself, which is actually why I just read her words. I mean, I, that, I really think it's beautiful, 
And, but that's the kind of stuff that it's doing, right? It's changing the future. The, the problem with the, with the drug, as Dr. Simon pointed out, is that it's only going to help, I say only, it's going to help 90%, which is fantastic, but it's not going to help 100%. And in fact, even the day that it comes out, there are going to be people whose lung function are so low that it actually probably won't be a benefit. Hopefully those people aren't that many, but uh, they'll be out there. Uh, and, and they probably would need a, tr uh, a transplant. And my brother David found himself in the same situation when he was 18, and uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about him. So my brother David and I, we were both born in Yale New Haven Hospital. I'm from Connecticut. I'm a Yankee, if you will. Uh, and I was born in 1970. My brother's two years younger than me, so he was born in 1972. I was diagnosed with CF when I was two. My brother was diagnosed uh, the day he was born. He had the, uh, the instruction, the intestinal uh, instruction obstruction of muconium ileus, and he had to have surgery on day one, and that's actually a picture of him in, uh, in the ICU in 1972. Uh, we were really close. Uh, I guess I like to hold him a lot, but uh, <laughs> he, uh, a lot of fun. We did a lot, a lot of stuff together. We grew up not far from the water. It was, I call it the ocean, but it was actually Long Island Sound uh, in Milford, Connecticut. That's, that's what it's called, and uh, well, come on, was that from the 70s? Uh-huh. <laughs> And uh, so that's us on the, on the beach. Um, I, don't, that's, I don't know who's who. That, my brother's the one on the right for sure. Uh, and that's a surf club. We used to play on the sandbar. It was, it was really just a lot of fun. Uh, okay, so in 1977, I was the poster child, excuse me, for the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation in Connecticut. And I mean, it's, that's adorable. Look at that. <laughs> That's me with the Yale Bulldog. If you know the Bulldog's the mascot for, for Yale, and uh, that's him. I don't know. I, I don't know if he's still around, but that's the guy right there. Uh, and then I got to like, do stuff like he gave an award to these tennis players. I don't know if you recognize any of them, but the one second from the right is actually uh, Jimmy Connors. So uh, I'm a big tennis player. I play a couple times a week, but I uh, got to give him an award. He was, I was giving him some advice on his backhand, I think, and he's... <laughs> Pretty good. And then uh, on the right there, the uh, DeFords lived in Connecticut, so we used to see him at events. Now, Frank DeFord, um, you know, if you don't know who he is, he's a sports uh, writer. He wrote for Sports Illustrated. He had uh, like a, a little show on NPR uh, commentary every week. He was on Bryant, uh, the real sports of Brian Gumbel. Uh, and he had a daughter named Alexandra, or Alex. And he wrote a book called Alex, The Life of a Child, and you, you may be familiar with it. They made it into a TV movie called, uh, well, with Craig T. Nelson, uh, played Frank DeFord. And that's me with Alex uh, and Frank DeFord. Uh, this was actually at the tennis event. As you could see, the whole six-foot rule thing wasn't applicable at that, well, not applicable. It just wasn't known. Uh, we didn't know what we were doing. You'll see a couple more examples of that. Uh, but that's what we did in, uh, in the 70s, so. Uh, I, I think that uh, the reason that in 1977, my dad was the president of the board of directors for the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation in Connecticut. And I think that's why I got to be, uh, you know, it's the right age, to be the poster child. Now, I, I think if you look at these pictures, again, I, I'm, I'm going to stay hard on this one. I'm, I was a cute kid, all right? I'm just going to tell you. But when you look at this, I really think... I think my brother David won, and so if just two years older and my dad were the president, maybe he would have been the poster child. Hard to say, hard to say. So uh, here's the thing. My brother's health was really a lot more compromised right from the beginning, obviously with the surgery. Um, and uh, he had to be hospitalized, you know, starting when he was seven, every, like, I don't know, for two-week times. That's what they, you know, they didn't have home IVs, so he used to go to the hospital, do IVs probably like three to five times a year for two weeks. So, you know, while I was uh, in the British exchange program, uh, I went to England for, uh, for a whole month while I was in like junior high. Or, and then I was on the high school tennis team. I was actually the captain of my tennis team. And I was in a, a youth group. I was the president of my youth group. And then I went to Lehigh University to study mechanical engineering. Uh, while I was kind of doing all that, you know, my brother was doing uh, postural drainage at home and uh, you know, get, going in the hospital for tune-ups. And uh, 
And so, it, listen, it's not to say that we didn't travel or do stuff. I mean, my brother, like, there's us in uh, Florida. His brother did some fishing. He was uh, in the band. He actually played, he played tennis, too. He was good. Uh, obviously, you could kind of tell there's very thin, right? But, uh, but he, was, he was good. By the time he was in high school, he was on oxygen 24-7. And uh, then he was in a wheelchair because he didn't have enough energy to get, even with the oxygen, to get around from class to class. And when he was 18, the doctor said, hey, now's the time, you need to go for a transplant. And so in the summer of 1990, he actually put, it, they put his name on the list for a transplant, and he got called less than one month after he got his name on, on the list, and he actually received a heart and lung, double lung transplant. And uh, you know, in the same hospital that he and I were born, uh, he got a second chance of life when he got his uh, when he got his transplant, and there's him. I, they had him on the bike. I, I don't know. If, I don't think that was day one, but that was pretty close. Uh, and there he is uh, on the right, just before he was he was going to be released. He's got that little smug look to him, which is uh, just very that's very David for sure. Uh, the transformation was really incredible. You know, he was released the the next year. He actually graduated high school, and this was something you think about it. I mean, it really shouldn't have happened, right? He shouldn't have graduated high school. Uh, but he had the transplant, and he did. And oh, gosh, it was just awesome to watch. I remember going to Florida not long uh, after he graduated, not long after the surgery, actually. And I have a picture I'll show you in a minute. But I remember looking at him, and I, I thought, wow, he's waterproof. And it, it wasn't like so much like, ha-ha, but it was like, I don't, like, you could, can you see the scar that he had? Like, right? like I'm like, wow. They, good job. I mean, they, they, really, they really did it. And so uh, that, was, that was David. So, you know, we did stuff. He, after that, again, he still tra we traveled. He did stuff that he was really not able to do uh, since well before, you know, high school. Uh, and he even did, like, a stair climb for CF. And there he is. That's, uh, the shirt say Heart Rock on it, right? Kind of clever. And, okay, check out my dad, right? My dad in that picture is the same age as I am now. Is that weird? I don't know. That's weird to me. <laughs> I don't know why it was weird. It's just like, hmm. He's always older than me, but in this picture, we're like the same age. <laughs> anyway, so uh, the year after his transplant, he actually was uh, all ready to go to, to college, actually Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut. And uh, they, the doctors recognized that he actually, his lungs were starting to reject. And so uh, he went on, did some more tune-ups and low doses radiation. And one of the surgeons, there's like a surgeon and then like the assistant surgeon. The assistant surgeon said, hey, listen, you can't go to college. We got to really like, do these treatments. And the head surgeon said, uh-uh, listen, we did the surgery so this, this young man could live. We're going to do the treatments, but he is going to college. And he went to college. Uh, and it was, it was really, uh, it was just awesome. So he, he's in college, and then uh, if I just fast forward, the Thanksgiving of, 20, of 1993, uh, he came home the night before Thanksgiving, and again, he was you know, st uh, still dealing with this whole rejection stuff. And he decided that he wanted to take finals and really uh, hit it strong. And so he said, listen, after dinner, I mean, he had discussed this, right, that he was going to go into the hospital and, and really like get an official tune-up so he could finish, uh, finish finals. So we had dinners. My mom made uh, her brother's favorite meal. Uh, my dad took my dad, brother to the hospital, and I went, my buddy picked me up, and we went out for dessert, so, because a bunch of my friends were home for the holiday as well. And uh, so I'm there at the Howard Johnson's, which is actually it's a hotel, but also a restaurant. We were having dessert uh, in Milford, Connecticut. And all of a sudden, the hostess comes over to our table and asks for my buddy and said he has a phone call. And that kind of made me uneasy. And again, no cell phones, right? So I'm like, hmm, OK. So he comes back, and I was very uneasy, of course, when he looked me in the eye, and he said, we got to go. Now, I didn't know what he knew, but I kind of knew I didn't want to know. And so the 10-minute ride to the hospital was silent. I told him where to park, and we went up to the, the, my brother's usual floor. When we got off the elevator, there, uh, one of his nurses was sitting in the windowsill, and she looked at me and said, sorry. And that's when I knew. I found the room, and my parents were there with our rabbi. 
and my brother was laying on the bed peacefully, not breathing. And uh, his lungs had been riddled with rejection. They couldn't handle another, another procedure. And after 21 years, his time had expired. I remember leaving the hospital that night, and the world, it was weird, right? We walked out, and the world felt different. I mean, it was different. It was a world without my brother. And, you know, everything that I was going to do from that point, what I do without him, I was a little, an only child at that point. And it was a hard concept to grasp. But I have to say it, it really still is. Because here I am, right? I'm battling the same disease that he's, he's battled. And he was always the front runner, right? He was always in the lead, maybe a glimpse of things to come for me. I mean, I didn't know, right? That would be the tune-ups, the hospitalizations, the oxygen, the wheelchair, the transplant. And he had always been, been in the front runner, and now he crossed the threshold, and I was in the lead. And it was scary. As you can expect, right, the next week was pretty difficult. We actually had a funeral the day after Thanksgiving, and then friends and family came over. Um, I was going to go back to Lehigh. I was doing my master's degree at that point. I needed a couple more days. The only thing I was going to miss, it was the end of the semester, was an on-campus interview with Chrysler Corporation. Now, when I had graduated undergrad in 1992, I couldn't find a job. I, I looked. I couldn't find one. And uh, it was a tough market. One of my buddies from my uh, freshman hall, he actually got a job with Chrysler. So I called him up, and I explained to him the situation. And uh, he actually coordinated a, f um, a phone interview instead of an on-campus, a phone interview. And uh, <clears throat> well, I'll, I'll tell you that I've been working at Chrysler for 25 years. It, it's weird to think that my brother's passing may have actually had anything to do with getting my job. I, I'm not saying I wasn't qualified. It's just kind of a, a weird connection, perhaps. But I, you know, I get this point, it really it doesn't matter. The, the only thing that matters is this, is that my mom noticed when my brother had his transplant and, and also after he passed that I really got a lot more involved with the CF community and in taking care of myself and my health. And, uh, and so I did. And I kind of developed what turned out to be like a formula, not a graph, but a formula, <laughs> which was essentially, uh, and I followed this. It was, sometimes it was conscious, sometimes it was probably uh, unconscious. You know, I would, get hooked up with a CF care center, get tied into the CF community, and like successful good things would happen. And so one of the things I did at that point, I was at Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, which is where Lehigh is, and I called the CF center and I said, I want to do something. And so they hooked me up with some walks, like a Great Strides walk. But um, this woman named Lynn, right in the middle there, she called me and she said, we have this support group. You should come and be part of the support group, which that's me in the back there, which obviously I did again, frowned upon today and wouldn't do it again, except it really filled a, a niche or, or a, you know, a gap, which is CF patients kind of collaborating and you know, sharing stories that we all had in common that perhaps you never thought that you would have in common with anybody. Uh, and so this was awesome. The, the thing is, one of the first times I went there, uh, Lynn said, what, you're not seeing Dr. Holslaw? I'm like, What's a Dr. Hoska? Well, he was in charge of the adult CF clinic down in uh, Hahnemann University Hospital in Philadelphia. And I go, well, let me meet this old wizard guy, Dr. Hoska. I used to call him Doogie Hoska, MD. I thought that was kind of funny. He didn't think it was funny. I thought it was funny. <laughs> and, uh, and so it was great. So I remember seeing him and he's like, hey, you're not doing treatments. Because at that point, I, I wasn't doing breathing treatments, I'll be honest. And uh, he's like, you should be doing them twice a day. And I go, Got it. And uh, I went back and maybe I did them twice a week. But when I started doing them, I realized that I was actually being very productive. My cough was productive and I'm like feeling better. And I'm like, maybe this guy's onto something. And, uh, and so uh, it wasn't very, it, listen, it didn't take very long. And I go, hey, we're lockstep. We came up with a plan and I, it's been changed ever since. Uh, and so I, I really give that to a uh, lot of credit to, to Lynn for hooking me up with Dr. Hoskaw and Dr. Hoskaw for showing me the way. Anyway, uh, I graduated at the uh, end of 94 and then I you know, moved to right here in Detroit area for my job with Chrysler. And, uh, and again, same formula, right? 
uh, CF Community and uh, CF Care Center. And he introduced me, to, he's like, you gotta go see this doctor. Um, and that's how I met Dr. Simon. <laughs> and that was us 25 years ago. And this was actually at an event, this is the biggest fundraiser in the Detroit area, it's called the Tennis Auction Ball. I don't know if anybody here is familiar with it, but they, we don't have it anymore. But we used to play tennis, people used to bid on the teams. Uh, it was a great fundraiser. My mom flew in one year and bought my team because I played in it and we came in third and then she got a necklace. So she, she still has it, it was fun. But what's interesting, and I was, I've been like thinking about this talk, right, for a while. It dawned on me tonight that 25 years ago at the tennis auction ball, Dr. Simon talked and then I talked. And I'm like, what well, like a duo, we've been doing this for years, except, <laughs> right? Except it's probably only like the third time it's happened. But, but nonetheless, it seems like it's a, like a thing. Anyway, so uh, I, here in Detroit, I got involved with walks and, and uh, the tennis auction ball. It was a lot of fun. Well, three years after being here, I got an opportunity to work still with Chrysler, but down in Kokomo, Indiana at a transmission plant. Uh, so I became a resident engineer down in uh, Indiana. And guess what? Same thing. I, the first thing I did before I even actually went to the, my first day on the, on the job at the plant, I went downtown Indianapolis. I knocked on the door at the CF Foundation, which was downtown at that point. And I go, okay, I'm here, what do I do? And they're like, who are you? And I said, well, I'm 27, I have CF, and I want to do something. And they laughed. And they said, oh, do we have something for you? And it turns out the Guys and Dolls auction was their biggest fundraiser at the time. And I, I kid you not, this was in September when I knocked on the door. Two months later, I'm strutting down the runway. There was music blaring and uh, in front of 800 people I didn't know and people bidding on a date package I had put together. Uh, and that's how I got introduced to Indianapolis and their fundraising scene. And uh, that's me and Laura. Laura bought me. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I'll tell you, because clearly you, you guys are very interested, $600, CSA. <laughs> and but listen, it might not sound like that much. Allow me to convert for inflation, because I looked it up, 950. Today, if it would happen today, 950. All right, so that's pretty, that, I think that's okay. Uh, and you know, the way it works, right? There's like 30 Paschal Bachelorettes, we have to raise a minimum of $1,500, put together a day package, they bid on it and we made you know, $150,000, $200,000 in a night. I met people that night that I was still, still friends with today. Two years later, I was chairing the event uh, and they had some great stuff going on in Indianapolis. Um, I also got involved with uh, Gene Cady golf tournament. Now, Gene Cady uh, used to be the head coach of Purdue University basketball and he used to have this great golf tournament and he used to invite like, his buddies <laughs> every year to, to golf. And uh, the guy on the left there is Charles Barkley. He's a lot thinner there than maybe you recognize him, but that's Charles Barkley. So I, I get to follow him speaking, I think, once. That's always fun. And then the gentleman on the right is uh, John Calipari. And he just, he's a head coach of the uh, University of Kentucky. He actually, they, their team just lost this last weekend in the Final Four. Don't feel bad for him. He got some ridiculous deal to coach at University of Kentucky. Until he retires, he'll be fine. He'll be fine. <laughs> Uh, they, again, did a lot of uh, really cool stuff uh, in, in Indy. Now, one thing, uh, in Indy I had a, a CF doctor, of course, and we didn't, we didn't get along. And I'm not going to blame Dr. Simon, but he set the bar really high. And, uh, but the truth is, I had high expectations, and I, I deserved them, quite frankly. And this doctor just wasn't communicating with me well or wasn't as responsive as I felt I needed to. And so we had the talk uh, about seeing other doctors. And, <laughs> and, and it turned out we basically, I wound up seeing another doctor in the practice, which is awkward when you go to a clinic, you're like, hey, and I, you, you go the other direction. But you know what, I mean, you have to advocate for yourself. It's very important and if something's not right and you, you feel you can get better care elsewhere, it's important that you stand up and you do the right thing. So, uh, so here I am in Indianapolis, and the game changer came when I, uh, I got an account on JDate. I never paid for it, by the way. This is online dating, uh, but Joelle did. And she bought me on JDate. She apparently she looked at it, and she goes, that's the guy I'm going to marry. And uh, well, here I am. Now, she had uh, two kids from a previous marriage. And, you know, I always thought that I'd get married uh, and that I'd somehow have kids. 
And you know, just like most males with CF, you know, I can't have kids the easy way. And uh, but I, so I wasn't sure how it was going to work out, but I just knew we figure it out. Whether it was you know adoption or something. Um, but then I meet Joelle, and she has two kids. And look at that, those are cute kids, right? And they, and they come with her. It's like <laughs> part of the package. And, and so I'm glad I didn't waste a lot of energy trying to figure it out, because in this case, uh, it just happened. Um, and so th this has you know, obviously been, uh, been a great thing. And uh, before you know it, all you got to, apparently, all you have to do, just, just add ring. And I had an instant family. <laughs> I, I met the kids when they were four and six, and when we got married, there, Brooke on the left is uh, eight, and Adam is six. <laughs> he's, that, he's so cute there. Unbelievable. <laughs> During the service, he actually, we were standing, and he actually was up there with us, and he grabbed my hand. Remember that? That was, oh, that was really sweet. Uh, good kid. Uh, and so here I am thinking, oh, here's, a, here's the other part. Their dad, who is very involved even today, but he did not live in Indianapolis. He lived in St. Louis. So I got to be like the dad. I, did, I was like the assistant baseball coach. Uh, I went to the daddy-daughter dance. I was the Cub Scout leader um, in our basement. We had all these meetings. I had that really good-looking uniform. And, uh, <laughs> and so I got, I got to do it all, and that was, that was pretty special for me. So here I am thinking I'm going to be an indie forever now that I have the family. And... Guess what? All of a sudden, because it was always supposed to go down to the plant for a manufacturing rotation for like three or four years. Then I meet Joelle. Okay, I'll stay here. That's fine. That's cool. And then I get a call from Detroit, and they're like, hey, we want you to come back up to Detroit. We had this job for you. And I'm like, mm, uh-oh. And so now I'd have to like say, hey, Joe, I know you have like work and friends and stuff. And then kids, I know you have school and friends and stuff, but we're going to move up to Detroit. Uh, but we did. And, uh, it, you know, it wasn't the easiest decision, um, but I, obviously it was definitely the right decision because, fast forward, uh, Joelle, who's a mental health therapist, she's right here on the, on the table here, but she's a mental health therapist. She, uh, she actually couldn't practice in Indy. She didn't have her license and didn't carry over because she's from Texas, but in Michigan she could. So she met this psychiatrist. They started, they had this booming practice down Bigham Farms, and she's actually a counselor to the stars, I, I'd say. She actually, this is, this is real, she's a counselor for this guy who's on Teen Mom OG. You, probably a lot of people here watch that, I can imagine. It's on MTV. You know, HIPAA, HIPAA rules would say, I, I can't show you the picture. And I'm like, um, this is on the internet. And MTV is like on cable, so I'm pretty sure he signed something. Uh, anyway, so she, she's doing great. Uh, and then the kids, they went to go to Wald Lake schools, and Brooke graduated two years ago from Northwestern University with a neuroscience degree. She's going back for a, hopefully a PhD in the next year or so. She's doing research right now. And Adam graduates like in a month from Tulane University with a biomedical degree. So I, th I think they adjusted well. That's just my opinion. Uh, so, th so there we are. Um, and then, you know, I hooked up again with Dr. Simon when I came back, right? And I really stepped it up in getting involved with the CF community. So uh, I'll tell you the kind of stuff that I did. I got a little slide for each one of these things. In Indianapolis, I got involved with the walk, and I used to do like a letter writing campaign. You guys hear letter writing campaign right now, but letter means email. But back then, I actually did a letter writing campaign with like, there's like an envelope, and I actually, there's like a piece of paper, and I had to fold it three times, and I had to stuff it, and I had the, they didn't have the pull strips. I had to lick the envelopes, and they used to stamp. And then they had to send stuff back to me, and then they had to collect it all and then turn it into the walk. That was a letter writing campaign. Well, that's transformed into, I have this awesome spreadsheet right now. If you guys want to check it out, I could go into detail. Not, not now, maybe later. Uh, but I keep track of everybody who donates, and now I send out emails. For the walk this year, I sent out 481 emails like, like Sunday, like a week and a half ago. And uh, I'm already at about $4,000, and that's a pretty good start. And the walk's for in like another three weeks, four weeks, four weeks at the zoo. It's going to be good. And so it's not hard to do. You just got to do it. And every year, you like just collect more names. Why not? You meet more people. Just add them to your list. Uh, and so that's cool. I'll talk a little bit more about that in, uh, in, a, in a minute. But um, here's something else. Uh, 
I got involved with one of these virtual conferences, right? So I said the support groups were great, like in, in um, uh, Bethlehem when we got together, but that's frowned upon now, and rightly so, for the, you know, stay six feet apart. So we have these virtual conferences, and some of you probably have participated, uh, but we all get in line. This is what the computer screen looks like. I was actually a keynote speaker with uh, Jerry Cahill and Emily Schaller uh, back in September of, of 17, but we got to talk, and then we go in like rooms and you talk about different things and everybody's pictures up there. It's a really cool method for communicating and you get to meet some really cool people and you get to talk about like CF stuff and, and who, do, who gets to do that, right? So that's really kind of cool. Uh, and then I'm on the board of directors for the CF uh, Foundation in uh, you know, head office here in Troy. And uh, last year I was the Great Strides ambassador and if any of you guys did Great Strides, maybe you saw my dorky videos. Come walk. No, not resonating. <laughs> Thank Shelly saw him. So this is what happened, right? So I, I made like this video, for example. I was like on a workout bike, and I'm like, hey, you should come to the walk. And I look on Facebook, and there's like 12 views. And I'm like, <laughs> so I'm like distraught, and I call Shelly up. I'm like, um, 12 views. Can you help me out here? Like, how is that even possible? Uh, unless this really sucked, and. Uh, I thought it sucked, quite frankly. I mean, why not? But she tells me, and I don't know if this is true, that she posted it, that the original video is 12, but like maybe other people saw it elsewhere. But clearly, none of these people saw it. So I'm, a, I'm going with 12, and I've watched it three times, so I'd like to find these other nine people. Okay. Uh, anyway, and then we, you know, we were talking, uh, I think Dr. Nasser talked about the advisory council um, but I'm on this advisory council with Dr. Simon, and we get to give feedback with other, it's, we do the, it looks like this when we meet, we have like all these screens going, uh, and we give feedback to the hospital about how to make um, the hospital better. That's kind of cool, like, I, I like, thank you for asking. Uh, and so that's kind of fun. Um, I also, I have a friend who got me involved with a CF roundtable. Now if you're, you know, just have kids with CF, you may not be as familiar, but this is a newsletter that, is written for CF adults by CF adults. It's really a fantastic uh, um, publication. It comes out quarterly. You could go to cfroundtable.com. You could sign up for free. You could get this whole uh, newsletter in your inbox, or you could actually get it in like, um, like what do you call this, the mailbox, like the real mailbox. I get mine in the ma real mailbox, because uh, I'm old school. Uh, and I like to hold it and, and read it, but you can sign up today and it's really cool. I was like the subscription manager for a while, but they, we have like over 3,000 people that are subscribed and anybody could subscribe. And we send it to uh, the, a lot of clinics and stuff as well. So uh, this was really kind of cool. And then uh, I was talking to the Gilead people here a little bit earlier, but I used to get these emails and I don't, I think they probably still do them, but you get these emails and it said, hey, if you take this 10 minute survey, we'll send you like $25. There you go. Well, that's a pretty good hourly rate. And so I'd, I'd take this survey online and then they'd send me like a check. And I'm like, that's cool. Uh, and they're you know, sponsored by the, the pharmaceutical companies and they, they need my input, I guess. I'll give it to them all day long. They ask like really easy questions like, what do you do? What do you think? Well, I, I do stuff and think stuff. So I <laughs> just put it down and everybody was good. So then I get a call one day and they're like, hey, we're doing a video shoot on uh, Kasten. What do you do when you get your first treatment, uh, first package? You know, how do you fit it into your life? And so uh, that's Joel and I at the video shoot. We did. We went to Chicago. It was like a real thing. There was like a director. There was like a teleprompter, and uh, I had to like write something, and like words were coming. And then the camera would pan, and I was like talking and moving my head. I don't know. It was well done. They had makeup. I wore this old man sweater. You could see there. <laughs> And they had like, a wardrobe, hey, we should wear this. They had uh, craft services. Joel and I really enjoyed craft services. Who wouldn't? Uh, and so actually, that's, you can see that's, uh, there's a video. I'm in the, like two videos. Check them out. Yeah, knock yourself out. And by the way, you know, and I got paid for it, which is nice, but nonetheless, it's just for like having CF. You might as well have a perk, right? I'll take it. So, and then finally, here I am now as, uh, you know, I call it the pinnacle, the guest speaker. And so that's really exciting. So, uh, I, uh, listen, I, I keep busy, but I'm, I'm really I'm determined to make a difference. So, 
Um, inspiration, this, this last section here on inspiration, just to share with you a couple tips and tricks and some things that inspire me. Uh, and so you say, hey, why would I be in, or, you know, do all this fundraising? And the truth is, from, from my perspective, I really feel it's important to be part of the solution. And, you know, I fundraise and I do these clinical trials, and I can't tell you enough, I think it's so important to do clinical trials. I, I was surprised uh, when he said, oh, don't just say no. I mean, I have a hard time just not saying yes. I'm like, well, wait, I should see if it fits into my schedule first. But I, I mean, wherever I could help, sign me up. Uh, but to me, I can't just sit on the couch and say, uh, you know, I'm really looking forward to this drug coming out. I want to be part of it. So listen, when this triple combo comes out, I feel like I'm part of it. I mean, I've been raising like fifteen dollars to $20,000 every year for the last 20 years. I was in the Syndico trial. I was in the trial for the, the phase two trial for the triple combo. I, I think I helped bring it out. I mean, there's a whole bunch of us, but I, I'm part of it. I'm part of the solution. And to me, that's really important. So, um, Fundraising. Some people are uncomfortable fundraising. I kind of get it. Uh, so here are quick rules. One, you can't take it personally. Now, it's hard not to take it personally, right? Because you're basically saying, hey, would you make a donation to me to help, you know, save my life or save my child's life? And they go, no. Like, how do you not take that personally? But you really just got to move on. And, and it, listen, it's different, right? Than it, I was at PetSmart this weekend. Uh, and you check out a PetSmart and they go, hey, do you want to make a $3 donation for a rescue dog? And you go, no, nobody knows, it's not a big deal, but, or not today, but this is personal, but you can't take it personally. And you, listen, you, are, you don't have the right to, to judge other, how p other people spend their money. So when somebody donates $20 and you're like, they could afford 50 or they give five and you know they could, and then you see them coming home from Costco and they have this tree lopper that you know they don't need. And you're like, <laughs> What? You gave me five dollars and you just bought this? You can't think that way. Listen, when you start fundraising, at the end of the fundraiser, you're going to collect way more than if you didn't. Go with, go with that attitude. Uh, so do it anyway. And you know what? Sending reminders is okay. So here's, here's what I do. Right? I go, I send out an email, maybe I'll send a reminder email, and then the people that you know should be donating, I just send them a text and I go, hey, did you get that email I sent last week? Uh, you know, a couple people say they never got it. Get them engaged. Okay, good luck saying no to that one. <laughs> Listen, it could happen, but you're going to get some responses. And then I always do more than one event. So I do like the Great Strides walk and, you know, reminder, reminder, nothing. And then I go, hey, the walk's over. And I'm sure they're like, Phew. and I'm like, don't worry. I'm doing a cycle event in three months. Here's the link. Right? That's clever. I do that every year. Um, so, and then be prepared to be inspired. Um, this is our uh, fundraising team from our, the walk last year at the zoo. Uh, but every year I ask people for money, and every year people donate, like every year. Some people say, oh, I'm only going to ask every other year because they're going to get tired. No, that's you, not them. People, I pay my taxes every year. People could donate every year, and they do. Um, I put a post up on Facebook, and I had uh, a guy from high school that I, I hadn't been in contact with since the 80s. He made a $500 donation. And he's been doing it every year since. That's pretty amazing. I mean, maybe he's able to do it, like financially able to do it, but um, I, I, I haven't talked to him since 1988, okay? That's like 31 years ago. That's a long time, yet he still made the donation. And I actually haven't asked him, but I know that if I asked him, I go, hey, why'd you make that donation? I really appreciate it, but why'd you do it? I'm sure he would say something like, well, because you asked. You might follow it up with a, because I can, and he'll probably say something like, well, I, I knew your brother in high school, I knew you, and you guys inspire me. That's what I anticipate, I don't know that. Um, but the truth is, people like that inspire me. I mean, people that, that are helping us out. You, you might go around thinking that you're all alone with this, and you are not alone. There are, there are people out there, so um, these guys inspire me. Uh, my parents inspire me. Um, it's a good picture, this is taken over, uh, over Christmas time, we were all together. We got some photographers to take our picture. And, uh, but my parents, you know, how they raised two kids with CF in the 70s before all this medication is just beyond me. They had, uh, you know, just amazing attitudes. And you know what? They weren't secretive about it. And I think, you know, being role models, like my dad was president of the board of directors. Okay, and now I am. I mean, that's probably not 
a coincidence, I guess. Um, and you know what, go into these uh, virtual conferences, I hear people saying, you know, my parents, we, they kept it a secret, they didn't tell our neighbors and all this, and I, I, I can't imagine a life like that. I, I think it's really important to, uh, to be engaged and to be open about it. So, um, you know, again, I, they allowed us, to, my parents allowed us to live. They, we went to sleepovers, we went to college, we um, took vacations, and uh, I owe them, owe them so much. I, I couldn't thank them enough. Um, I, inspired by Joelle, uh, you know, okay, so my parents, maybe you could tell at this point, they were the kind of parents that would say, oh, you're so wonderful, you're so great, all this kind of stuff, and you know, I'd eat it up and, and I'd, I'd buy it. But in the back of the head, your head, you know, you're thinking, hey, I got a pre-existing condition, who's, re okay, who's really gonna wanna be with me, right? There's always that little part that's of self-doubt. Of self and, uh, and Joelle said, hey, sign me up. And, and I give her a lot of credit for that. Um, so thank you. And, and then of course, she has to deal with my personality and it's just one of those things, it all comes together. Uh, and then you have people like my brother, uh, again, an inspiration. He was, uh, he had the same genotype as me again. You know, I wasn't sure about that and I asked Dr. Simon, he said, yeah, of course, same parents. So clearly having the same genotype, it, it's not uh, exactly the predictor of the future, uh, but it's not how it works. But my brother is one tough cookie. He had an amazing attitude and I, be honest, I think about him every day and I take him with me uh, every day. And then you know, the medical staff just in general and uh, you know, like Dawn Cruz, who's our uh, clinical trial, she, if you don't know her, you gotta know her. She's an inspirational woman. She, she is so passionate about everything and do, raising money for CF and her flowers and her candy. She's amazing. Uh, you gotta get to know her. And, and Dr. Simon, as I said, yeah, I've known him for, for now 25 years. He is so thorough. Every time I see him, he's just, he never ceases to amaze me. He's a, a walking Wikipedia. Is that a thing now? <laughs> I couldn't say encyclopedia, I'd seem like 50 years old, that would be ridiculous. Uh, he's a walking Wikipedia, he knows everything about CF, if he doesn't know it, he finds out. And uh, he's been, been just absolutely great to work with, so thorough, and clearly, uh, you know, people like Dawn and, and Dr. Simon, Simon, Dr. Nasser, they, this is more than a job for, for you guys, we, you could tell. So, uh, something Dr. Simon told me uh, tw over 20 years ago in an email, yes, we had email, um, he said, stay as healthy as possible for as long as possible so when advances come, you'll be ready. He wasn't talking about the, the Vertex drugs. He couldn't have, right? That was a thing to come. But, but he's right, right? So you gotta stay healthy because if you let yourself decline, these other drugs are not gonna just all of a sudden lift you up. You gotta stay there so they can help, uh, help keep you there. And you know what? You gotta have a relationship with your doctor and you said it great. Don't lie to your doctor. <laughs> Because I was like, I, I mean, I'll be honest, I, I don't miss a treatment, I don't miss a pill, I don't do it. Um, and I talked to the doc and he's like, not everybody does. And I'm like, what? And he said, yeah, people don't take their medication, they don't do it. And I'm like, well, did they tell you they do? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, can you tell? He said, yep. He, said, he knows. How does he know? He knows. You can, listen, you know. So uh, don't miss, you know, stay adherent or compliant. Anyway, real quick, routine to me is the, is the key. Here's my routine, I make a smoothie every morning, I add Scandi Shake when I need to, I pack my lunch every day, I add calories, I like variety, um, and I work out at the gym every day. I, to me, I don't work out three days a week, I just say screw it, I'm going every day, keep the same routine, I wake up at you know, five in the morning every day, all during the weekdays, and I think it's important to get to move around. When I was at Lehigh, I was just recreational, I did swimming, I, now we have a dog, I walk the dog, I play tennis twice a week, whatever it is, but I keep active. Uh, and so, very important. Um, treatments, to me, multiple, I have multiple machines. Uh, convenience means compliance. Uh, we were talking about, you know, I have a Pari machine, but there's uh, um, some uh, other companies that make some machines. I have actually like one for each four, because why schlep them around? And I'm not, it's not gonna be like, oh, I'm already upstairs, I'm not gonna do my treatments. Well, I just have a machine upstairs. Um, and you know what, in the end, I, I, I think it's the way to go. I have Parry Truck, Trek S, and I do it, uh, treatments on the, in the car, so I like to multitask. I actually have a machine downstairs so I can do an elliptical, my vest, watch TV, uh, and do a treatment. It's like four things. 
I think I, I'm winning on that one, right? And then I thought, hey, as parents, like students, if you're students, what would you do? I'd say, hey, you'd either have them combine, uh, like do a treatment and possibly like watch a video or a book on tape or whatever where they could learn homework or they do their homework and then all of a sudden it's like a treat for them uh, to watch TV while they're doing a treatment. So, and then I do my case and treatments at the gym and I don't hide. Again, if you make it really difficult, it's hard to do. So that's me actually at the gym. I just, people ask me questions, but I don't, I don't take it personally. I don't get defensive. If I'm gonna do my treatment out in the open, I gotta be ready for questions. So I am, and then that's me at my desk uh, with our dog. See that in the monitor, isn't that cool? Uh, so I just keep it, keep it open. And then, listen, I, uh, here's my pill case. I keep it on me, of course, at all times. Um, this thing is awesome. Uh, and you could see the pills. I think it's cool, although we were talking and they said, boy, teenagers wouldn't like that. But I, I have uh, pills I could I have enough for an entire day if I need it. I keep two bottles of pills at work. I put pills in Joel's purse, and uh, I didn't tell her. I just told her about it the other day. She's like, really? I'm like, yeah, I put some in a Ziploc bag, threw them in a pocket that apparently you never look at. <laughs> and, uh, and they're there just in case I need them. I got to hit them all over the place. And, <laughs> And whenever I eat, I, uh, you saw, I take my pill case and I just put it on the table because you, know, you can't take them all right at the beginning because I like to eat for a long time. And you can't take them at the end, they're not effective. So I take pills throughout the meal. But when you do that, you're opening yourself up for questions. So again, can't get defensive, you just have to have comeback. So for example, somebody might say, uh, oh, you're doing drugs? I'll be like, uh, yeah, I, of course. Do you want one? And then I'll actually, <laughs> I'll take one and I'll put it on, I will give that to them. And that's, that's cool because people are cool making these, these comments, but they don't just take drugs that you give them, trust me. They go, oh, well, what would happen if I took that? Which is a pretty legitimate question to ask. And I say, well, here, let me just say this. I, have, uh, I don't make all the enzymes I need to digest my food, so when I take this, it helps me digest my food. But you have all your enzymes, so I think if you took this, you probably just get constipated. And I gotta tell you, I don't know if that's true or not, but nobody's ever taken one of my pills. <laughs> Then of course, every day I, I clean my nebulizers. Uh, real quick, if you don't have Medicare or, or Medicaid, you gotta take advantage of these assistance programs. Uh, I was talking to uh, Kevin over at, at uh, Allergen. Um, this is the one I'm, I'm, I'm talking about here, but all the, the drug companies, listen, the drug companies, they make a lot of money off of you buying the drugs, right? When you said that half the people don't fill their stuff half the time, well, guess what? The drug companies then aren't getting their money. They want their money. So if they have to pay your copay, oh, they'll do it, right? They'll pay like 80 bucks so they can get their, their, their money. And so you gotta, don't be proud, just tap them for it. But uh, um, the assistant program, the Live to Thrive program, I think is phenomenal. Uh, Cause I use NPEP, there are other, other uh, enzymes out there, but I get, uh, they pay for my copay 100%. And then I get um, uh, vitamins every month. And then I get like a supplement, like, Cliff bars or protein or these, uh, these like Ensure type drinks, Kate Farm ones, they're awesome. And then you go, well, where do you get your nebulizers? Boom, I get points every month. I just get my, I like redeem. It's like the only program, you know, like Verizon, they say, oh, use your points to buy a magazine. I don't know what the hell that is. I'm gonna get signed up for a magazine I'm never gonna read. This, I acquire points, I cash them in, I get a nebulizer, now I don't have to pay for it and they send it, it's so easy. You should use this all the time. Um, and then technology. I use my cell phone just to keep track of appointments, questions I have the doc, and I think it's important. I was resistant to use this U of M portal. Were you guys resistant to use the U of M portal? I don't know why I was. I'm like, I'm not using that. I think it's awesome. I, it's how I communicate with a doctor. I get my scripts filled, and then uh, um, I could find out what my medications are and, and all kinds of crazy stuff. So anyway, uh, he, here's the deal. Um, my parents, you know, they've been doing this for a long time. They started going to, meet, to meetings like this before they even identified the gene that causes CF, and they left those meetings disappointed, frustrated. In 1989, they identified the gene that causes CF, and they were like, yes. What, they, they thought they'd come to one of these meetings, and they're like, yeah, we got a cure. And again, they left somewhat discouraged. Palmazine came out, Toby, uh, Kasten. Um, but they were, because I was talking to my parents about this, they said if they were sitting out in the audience now, they would be ridiculously encouraged, uh, more than you could possibly imagine, 
because of all the stuff that's coming out. So I, I mean, as disappointing as it is that you're actually in this situation, now is such an amazing time uh, to be there. So, um, you, you know, just to, to finish this up here, you know, 25 years ago, my health was pretty good, my routine, not so good. My brother just passed away from CF, the same disease that I have, and then I moved 700 miles from home, 700 miles from my parents, um, and I, I thought I might be going down the same path as my brother. So, all of a sudden, a lot's hap happened since then, right? I mean, I, I have a family, I immersed myself in the CF community, I developed a positive attitude, I think I try to do the right stuff, I stay physically and mentally uh, active, and I find out where the limits of my body are, and sometimes I push them a little bit, and I think that's okay. Um, and I know that there's absolutely no true formula f for a certain future. I mean, it's not how it works, right? But everybody has their own journey. Don't sell yourself short. Set your expectations high, uh, and, then, uh, and then go for it. So my, my parents never stopped stop me from going to college or moving away from home or doing whatever. I, I often wondered every time I made that next phase what would happen. Uh, but with uh, all the new medications come out, coming out, it's impossible not to be excited about what the future holds. I mean, just absolutely impossible. So for me, reti retirement from Chrysler with my peers is potentially not, not far away. I mean, think about that. Decades ago, I, you, you never talk that way. Um, and so it's really inc incredible. So I'm anticipating retirement, but I gotta tell you, I can wait, right? Because there's a lot that's gonna happen be between now and then. A lot of living that has to do, that has to happen. So I didn't choose a life with CF, but I'll tell you this, I'm determined to make the most of it. I'm really inspired by a lot of people. I'm inspired by all of you, and I'm all in. Thank you.